Welcome to the Crash the Pond podcast. It is a Monday, June 5th, 11 p.m. edition of the podcast. 11 p.m. Eastern. 11 p.m. Eastern. I'm on the East Coast, as some as some know, not all know, uh, on a bit of a family trip in Montreal. Actually in the home stretch, two days left, but was not planning to do a podcast, Jake, uh, especially mm-hmm. not from my laptop, which is why... For those listening, you might notice a difference in audio quality. Uh, but the Ducks chose to to force the podcast. They, 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 they forced our hand. Yeah. Yeah. We weren't planning. I mean, full disclosure, we were planning to take three weeks off. And then we'd hit it hard in June, uh, starting next week with the knowing that the draft be coming up. The Ducks, I mean, Peverbeek said, at, I like re-listened to his availability when he let Aikens go. So he's like, yeah, I'm hoping to have it done by the draft, but. I mean, who knows? Maybe not. And then he kind of said, yeah, maybe it's not going to be done by the draft. And so I'm like, oh, sweet. We're good. We're not going to have to worry about any podcast this week. We're still in good shape. They're probably not going to announce a coach. And then boom. Yeah. This morning it drops. And it's like, oh, well, guess Felix is doing a podcast from Montreal. Yeah. And I also just realized that I'm not logged in on StreamYard. So I oh. can't see any chat. So that's well, fun. Yeah. I mean, you if, can just pull it. log in. Huh? You can just pull up Twitch on like and it's whatever, whatever. I'll I've got it up. I'll just let everyone cook you, uh, and you won't uh, be able to see it. Yeah. So to actually say the quiet part out loud, the reason that we're recording is because today the Ducks named Greg Co- Greg Cronin head coach. I think the eleventh head yep. coach in franchise history. Yep. And uh, what an exciting bit of news because we've. Really, for the last couple of weeks, it, it's been really radio silence on the Ducks hiring front. You know, we, we had some connections to, to the Ducks. I think Andrew Burnett, Spencer Carberry, names thrown about, but never Mike really. Mike Yeah, never anything really concrete. And finally, here we are where there's there's a man, there's a there's a name to the face. And it's all systems go from here. Yeah, and I mean... I think Elliot Freeman last week said that Pat Verbeek was going to be interviewing people at the the combine this week. So this kind of came out of left field and just kind of shows how under wraps Pat Verbeek was able to keep this seeing as, I mean, they had to have been close at the end of last week if they announced it this morning. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's really, really exciting. And I think the interesting thing with Greg Cronin is, I mean, being quite frank, I knew really nothing about him, but before yeah. this. This is a name prior to his name being linked to the Ducks. I could not have told you really who he was, who he was the coach of, where where he was at, what his methodologies are. But just for those of you that haven't been able to listen to everything that's come out today, because there's been a lot of information. The Ducks at a press conference with both him and Pat Verbeek. And then on their podcast services, they put out um, put out an interview with Kent French, Guy Bear, and, and Greg Cronin. And they did another one that was much shorter with Pat Verbeek. But my takeaways from all these interviews is the Ducks made a fantastic hire here. And granted, right now, first day of him being the coach, you can't really judge him as of right now. We'll have him. We'll we'll have him six months or so until we can really judge him, and in terms of the product that he's putting putting on the ice. But I think just from the initial, um, my initial feelings on this after kind of hearing all this is. I can't help but be excited because everything that he said is exactly what you want to hear. Everything Paver Beek said about the situation is what you want to see from a general manager when he's looking for a new head coach. And I think all this just points to the Ducks being headed in the right direction. And while this year was obviously a major step back from the on-ice product and much lower than what we expected, it seems like even though this was a bit of a detour, the rudder and the ship is still going in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and that's the thing is that going into this, neither of us really knew that much about Greg Cronin. And there's still a lot that we don't know. Yeah. I think we'd be lying if we said to everyone, oh, yeah, we are the Greg Cronin experts. But just to give everyone, I guess, some background, Greg Cronin, although this is his first NHL head coaching duty, he is 60 years old like this. He has been yeah. he is a hockey lifer. He has, he has been in hockey as a coach professionally for, I think it's over 30 years now. So he's been at this for quite a while. He, I mean, to give 
people an idea of how long he's been around. He coached at the University of Maine when Paul Correa was there. Yep. And so that just gives you an idea of how long he's been around. And perhaps on one hand, that would give you a little bit of alarm. That would give you a little bit of cause for, oh, is this just another guy who's been around forever? Kind of like a Rick Bonus type. But instead, you know, hearing just commentary from people in Colorado, because he was coaching the Colorado Eagles of the AHL, the, the Avs uh, Farm Club for the last few years, hearing the positive commentary on him there, and then actually hearing him speak today, you would never guess that this is like pretty much an old school coach, even though yeah. um, he, like he is old school and just how long he's been around and his relative age, but the energy, the feedback that you hear about him and the things he's actually saying don't align with that at all. Like he brings a very fresh energy to the table. Yeah, Pat Verbeek had actually a quote at the very end of the the press conference that said, uh, "I think what I really liked about Greg is he has an old, he has old school principles, but new school methods of teaching." And I thought it's a great combination, something that I loved and I was really looking for. Yeah, and and that's something that you heard from people in Colorado and people that co- covered him in the AHL is that uh, Greg Cronin is he's a bit of a hard ass. He's a, he's not like necessarily a disciplinarian, but he's a guy who has a very tough approach who's going to tell players like it is except as he mentioned and kind of as Pat Verbeek alluded to he's able to walk that line of keeping it constructive and I mean I think that it's hard to it's hard to make it as long as he has if things aren't necessarily working out for him if those methods aren't yeah. working and also when you get that much glowing commentary from people whether it's in hockey or media those are people who don't necessarily have to say anything nice and, and people are going to bat for him. So just that alone, I think tells you that he's not someone who's necessarily like belittling people or is, is like burning bridges left and right just to go out and win some games. No. And there were, I mean, there's a bunch and we'll get into all of it, but I, I think kind of, as you're mentioning this, one of the things that comes to my mind of something kind of, he was talking about was, and I think this is so critical when you talk about old school and can be in hard ass at times, but it also seems like with everything he is open to learning and changing and evolving. And he even mentioned, he's like, um, I heard once that a coach kind of would ask every player, like, what are, what makes them tick? What are they into? What do they do outside of the ring? And he's like, I don't do that enough. And he's like, I should really do that more to really know my players, understand them and connect with them on a much, on a much more personal level with that. And you have to do that with the modern day players in order to to connect with them in that fashion. And I think that that was, uh, I think that just goes to show the, the depth that he's gone to the work that he's put in the change that he's able to make throughout the years and how much he can really understand, um, understand how the players can grow, what really helps make them tick and what helps you connect with them. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and so that's the thing is that, even though he gets these reviews of being a bit tough on his players, I think that what's good, you know, when we were talking about Dallas Aikens when he left is that there was an element of, Hey, he's this really good guy. And it sucks because you want to see those kind of coaches succeed. And you just don't know if the ducks were necessarily going to be able to replace that. And yet it seems like they've actually managed to keep that element that people really liked about Dallas Aikens but very clearly upgrading yeah. everywhere else across the board. Here's a quote, actually. This was an Eric Stevens article. I just have a bunch of them open for quotes readily available to re- that I really enjoy that I find uh, very useful. Uh, from Greg Cronin, today's athlete, the relationship building is critical. You can be hard, but you also have to be compassionate. You go all the way back to when Pat was playing. We joked about this. Guys got ripped apart in locker rooms, and nobody was there to put them back together. They had to do that themselves. You can't do that today. I don't think that works. And it goes back to uh, to that relationship. The depth you create in that and the trust factor. When the player knows you care about him and you're invested in his growth, I think that goes a long way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that that's... I don't want to say that Dallas Higgins was too nice because I think that with everything we've heard in hockey the last few years about how toxic it can be, you don't want to, you don't want to almost use that against a, a coach that he's too forgiving or too much of a player's coach. Cause that's clearly important, but there is a line where you have to be able to almost like 
use that equity that you've built with the players to get more out of them. As, yeah. You know, you don't want to make it sound purely transactional, but that's what a coach is there to do. And at times it almost felt like Dallas Akins was building all this equity with his players, building all this goodwill. And maybe it's because it was just in the lost season and it didn't matter, but it never felt like he was then able to leverage that into an actual system or an, a discipline and, in the way they played. And, and one of the things that I know that, I mean, it's hard not to make the comparisons because they're, they're right there, but I think kind of getting away from even that portion of it and comparing Dallas Akins to, uh, to Greg Cronin, one of the things that really stuck out to me listening to Greg Cronin talk about uh, teaching and reading all that stuff and seeing how much he really values teaching these players, developing these players, moving them along. And there was a really interesting conversation he had in the the podcast that he did about Alex Galchenyuk and how basically he didn't want to try teaching him in the first couple of games. He wanted to wait till practice and he would videotape the practice uh, to help him really identify how to defend properly. And then basically they would go over that and then in a game, it kind of clicked for him finally when he never thought it would be able to click for him in the defensive zone. And the one thing that really stuck out to me was how much he really preached being able to teach players. And I think while Dallas Akins was, a, I think, a good AHL coach, I feel like when he was in the NHL, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm misremembering, um, but I feel like he had mentioned so many different times that this isn't a development league. The NHL is yeah. not a development league. And it's time for us to win games. Like there were a lot of those quotes, I think, especially the first couple of years. And I feel like it was to the detriment of the Sam Steeles, to the detriment of the Troy Terry's, to the detriment of the Max Jones, Max Comtois, all these guys that were coming up. And it's almost as if there wasn't a focus on teaching these guys at times. And this is just purely anecdotal. Don't really have any evidence for it, but we didn't see the development was an issue with all those guys. And I think what Greg Cronin's kind of shown here is that, that's not something he's going to leave out on. And even if Pat Verbeek, Pat Verbeek, uh, Verbeek wants to take the, the slow and steady method with some of these guys, Greg Cronin someone that is going to be able to help them when they make the NHL level and still teach them. And Greg mentioned that um, one of the things Greg? that he really – Greg Cronin, what, whatever. There, Can we just uh, tell people why you, you love this hire? Uh, we'll get there. We'll get okay. there. Um, okay, we'll get there. But he had talked about kind of helping Zdeno Chara back in the day and how really identifying what that was needed or what was needed for him and how it was to be quiet between his, uh, in his words, his nipples and his knees. And uh, and then also talked about a guy like Brad Hunt, who he coached this year in the, in the AHL and how for a smaller guy, he's like, he doesn't have that ability to reach around. If there's a mistake that happens, it's going to be amplified because he can't really make up for it in the same way. So it's all about his footwork. And we really focused on that. And I see all of that, and I think this is the perfect guy to coach a guy like an Olin Zellweger, a guy to coach a Pavel Minchukov, a guy that can really help them learn, help them teach, or help teach them, and really fit fit them in the right spot there. Um, so th- those were a couple of things there that really caught my eye, or I well, guess yeah. in this. And going back to the Aikens teaching thing, because here's the thing. To, to analyze the new coach, I don't think you can do that in a vacuum. Because there is an element of, hey, a lot of these things that these guy, this guy was hired for, in part, we can probably infer were because of deficiencies that were there before with the previous coach. You know, I don't want to make this all about Dallas Sickens, but it's at least worth just kind of putting them side by side and figuring out where Cronin may shine, where Aikens didn't. And you pointed to development. And I think that if that's if that and it sounds like it was a huge part of this evaluation for Pat Verbeek, if that's what they keyed in on, that's absolutely a correct place to key in on because if like you said, if you look at the last few years with the Ducks, how many young promising players they had come in who really ended up sputtering. I mean, you think about Sam Steele, Max Contois, you think about um, you know, Josh Mahura who left. I mean, you can you can make a little bit of a list here. And it's not pretty for the Ducks. And does that mean that that's all the coaching staff's fault? No. But really watching even just the players I named over the years, it was very unclear where these guys were actually improving, where they were getting better. Um, Something tangible in their game that was actually uh, going in the right direction, whether you're looking at the numbers or the eye test. And we don't know yet how that will work for Cronin. You know, he this is his first time doing this specific job in the NHL. Mm-hmm. 
But if that's something that they keyed in on as a reason to hire him in part, that's fantastic because that is absolutely 100% been maybe the biggest weakness of this team the last few years, because it's one thing to be bad and, and lose games, but as a rebuilding team, you really need to, to develop your younger players. You really need those guys to turn into something, at least some of them. Yeah. And the fact that they really failed to do that, it hasn't, it hasn't set them back because they still have this great pool of, of young players yeah. now in part because they lost so many more games, but maybe it'd be nice to have a Sam Steele or a Contoir or Mahara or whoever who can just fill out your lineup. We're going to be a little cheaper, right? And instead now you have to go shop for those guys in free agency. That's not the end of the world, but it just goes to show that there's always value you can add with development to a franchise. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Um, a couple other things that really want to touch on in that interview. Also, um, I think it was on the behind the bench podcast feed from the ducks, which this is episode two of that. There was one episode before the season with Dallas Akins. Oh, and that's this, right. This is episode two of that. Um, but he was asked by Kent French about uh, analytics. And that's something that you and I obviously are always going to be put an eye towards because anyone listening to the show knows how much you and I use it, how much you and I think it's important, how much it, it really tells you about the game that you may miss with your eyes. And I actually, you had not heard it yet. And prior to us going live, I actually put it into my microphone for you able to be able to hear. So I'm actually going to let you uh, kind of explain what uh, Greg Cronin was preaching. Okay. I'll do my best, but I'll start with this. When most NHL coaches or hockey coaches get asked, hey, what do you think about analytics? You know, how do you incorporate them? I mean, Kent French even teed him up in his answer or in his question a little bit, being like, how do you strike the balance with analytics? Because most coaches will answer, oh, well, you know, it's a balance. It's a tool in the toolbox. You got to think about how you can match that with what your eyes are telling you. I mean, you've heard so many coaches over the years say that, right? That exact mm-hmm. spiel. Mm-hmm. Instead, Greg Cronin goes into this very specific, hey, the, the stats that we have today, and he, he talked a little bit about the background of, of analytics in, in years past, kind of when it was on the ground floor of what it could tell you. But what he, what he really went into was, hey, now with, with analytics, it can tell us which shots are the most important, which shots have the best chance of going in, what types of shots, what types of passing plays, right? He referred to, he basically broke it down this way. An, an unscreened shot from the wing has about, what he, he said, a 1% chance. Uh, under 1% one, uh, 1% or under 1%, yeah. And that's a shot outside of the home plate. So basically a point shot, which, uh, hmm, wonder who's been complaining about point shots all these years. What podcasts? Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know to be I fair, it was unscreened, but yes. I mean, but that's anyway, but, but he would still have the information for a screen point shot, even. but then he talked about, okay, well then what's the percentage on a screened point shot. And then he went into, okay, well then what's the percentage on a East to West pass coming inside the home planner. And he just basically broke it all down. And it's like, he was rattling off percentages for each shot. Like he knew them like the back of his hand. And then he went even further talking about how nowadays with the, the data that's available mm-hmm. to teams, how he can go into his forecheck, how how that can affect the message he's re- relaying to his players, and maybe more than anything besides just the actual details and minutia that he was talking about, it was just the energy that he was bringing, and that's a consistent theme throughout the entire interview. But he was just he sounded not just excited to talk about it, but it was like, hey, this is something that I'm passionate about. That this is something that's part of my profession because he's passionate about being a coach. And this is just a way to help him coach better. That was yeah. basically how it all boiled down. And I have never, I have never heard a, a coach in professional hockey talk about analytics that way. Yeah. The energy that he brought, the, the specific details that he brought, and just clearly an enthusiasm for using it, and even evidence of saying, "Hey, I used it this way at previous levels." Um, and it was it, it was much more than just lip service. And in addition to that, this was, I think, something that I loved from it. He's like, if I'm going to preach that we play fast and we play hard and we get on the four check, the numbers have to back that up. He's like, I can't just say we play that way and then we play that way. There needs to be proof in the pudding here. It can't just be a pure conjecture. And that's exactly what you want to hear. You don't want to hear someone saying, oh, they don't matter because they don't show me as being a good coach. 
This is a guy that clearly pays attention to them. And if his team is struggling in that, he's going to work on that and identify it. And all they are, like, I mean, they are tools. And they're tools to help you identify where your weakness is at and how you can fix that. And if that weakness is not something that you want. And both from an offensive and defensive perspective, because all all of the things that you just talked about from percentages, you can use that in the, the offensive side of things and on the defensive side of things. Yep. And yep. use that to help identify that. And he mentioned that also about stick checks in the home plate area and how his team was a top five team in that in the AHL um, based upon the data that they had. And all of that just goes to show that this is someone, and this was also my takeaway, it kind of echoes what you were stating, stating, but he's a hockey nerd. Like you don't understand all of those numbers. You don't dive into those numbers. Like you and I, like just put it bluntly, you and I will look at evolving ho- hockey and we'll just text back and forth. And we'll both just like look at hockey viz one day and start texting about it or throw it in discord or whatever. And you have to be a hockey nerd to really enjoy looking at those minute details, looking at those numbers, trying to understand it, trying to break it down, trying to see these various different things. And that is what he is. He's not just someone that loves the game, enjoys it, this is his life. He's a nerd about it and wants to get better, wants to improve, wants to find advantages that he can use. And that's what you want in a head coach. And so that was, I think there was a lot of the interview that I absolutely loved. That's, I think, what put me over the top for him. And I think CJ on Twitter put it that he's 80-20 right now, with the, as in just like fully on board 80-20, because the 20 is just, we haven't seen a game underneath him yet. But everything he's saying is the right thing, and it feels different than how it was with Dallas Higgins. We talked about it a lot, that Dallas Higgins felt like he said all the right things. But it kind of almost more so, they weren't hockey cliches in a way, but it was more so about the emotional side of things. Yeah. And this feels like that plus the added element of all of these minute details. And I mean, Paverbeek talked about it. Um, this guy was prepared and understood all the details in that eight hour interview that they did. They went over practice film. They went over film from when the goals played the, the, the Eagles. Eagles. And like, this is someone that is really all about the details and that's what you want. And so it, it was, I think everything about this has become impressive. I think the fact that this is someone that Paffer Beak was able to identify is also impressive out of this. Um, and that he keyed in on him and he seems like he's the right coach for the job. Yeah. And I think that, you know, someone might say, oh, well, you guys just like him because he likes analytics, right? Or that you guys just like him because he lines up with your beliefs. And Maybe that's partly true, but what I would say why any fan should be excited about what Greg Cronin said today and just the coach that Greg Cronin is, is that what all of this indicates, if you just boil all of this down, is that he's curious about the game, right? That he has an open mindedness, that he wants to use every possible tool and that he wants to have every possible advantage to help his team win, which regardless of where you stand on analytics or eye test or whatever, that's a good thing. That is just a a plainly good thing is that you want to seek every advantage. Um, And then secondly, like there, this was just the first thing that popped off the page to me when, when he reading his comments and and hearing him speak is just that there's, there's just an energy. There's almost like a joy um, in, in the way he speaks and in the way he approaches the game. And clearly that energy can cut both ways He can be tough on his players, but it seems to be coming from a really good place. And I just think that when you combine those two things, that real, that real joy, that real passion for the game, plus that curiosity and that, that desire to, to rack up every advantage, you've got a very interesting coaching profile there and potentially someone that can do really well in the NHL. And it's like you said, Dallas Higgins said a lot of nice flowery things, both when he was in the AHL and, when he got introduced at Great Park alongside Bob Murray in 2019. But this does feel different because not only is this guy, you know, everything we just said, but he, he has been around quite a long time and he's got a very kind of varied experience. Whereas Dallas Aikens, it was like, well, we already had kind of a feel with the way Edmonton went. And we, outside of that, it was really just the AHL stint. Like, uh, 
uh, Greg Cronin has bounced around. He's coached at the inter- international level, college level, professional level. Mm-hmm. And it's almost a great story because he's 60 years old and it feels like he's hitting his prime. Like, like yeah. now it's been a build up to this point. Yeah. And now every experience, every bit of knowledge he's accumulated, he's just going to unleash it on the NHL. Yep. So, and, and that's what we were clamoring for. We wanted to see someone who was just a little bit from a different path. It didn't have to be, it didn't have to be like a Marty St. Louis out of coaching Pee Wee, but just anything that wasn't a retread. And the Ducks delivered on that. Yep. And Pat Verbeek had this quote uh, when I think he was asked about uh, Greg Cronin's system defensively. And he said, I wouldn't say his structure is going to be defensive. I'm going to say it's going to be the complete opposite, actually. We're going to play hard. We're going to play fast. Part of playing fast is getting down the ice and into the offensive zone. The other part of it is puck possession. So maybe defensive only in the sense that we're going to control the puck more. Yeah. And Which that's, is perfect. And I think that that's even more encouraging to hear also from Pat Verbeek, mm-hmm. right? Because he's the one pulling the strings on everything. He's the one creating this roster. Yep. And and th- that was a bit of a concern when I saw that on Twitter, people saying, oh, he's a defensive-minded coach. But it sounds like that approach to defense is the one that we've talked a lot about, which is yeah. just pressure the, the living hell out of the other team. Yeah. And I'll be very interested to see how this all shakes out because this kind of pressure style almost reminds me a, bit, a little bit of like the Carolina Hurricanes. Mm-hmm. But the way that Cronin spoke about shot quality – makes me think not like Carolina Hurricanes when attacking. Yes, it's not going to be shots from all over. The other thing that kind of stuck out, sorry, various different things from this are are coming to mind. Yeah. But Greg Cronin really kind of seemed high on the Ducks prospect system. Yeah. And I really, and while Verbeek kind of, I think, pushed back a little bit on that and kind of said he wants guys, wants to make the NHL to be be there and, and not have to go back down. I feel like Greg Cronin might be pushing for some of these younger guys like an Olin Zellweger to be in the NHL next year. I think once training camp hits and he has conversations and gets them on the ice, it seems like he's really someone that's not going to shy away from putting guys into spots to thrive. And we're not going to end up with guys on lines with, I mean, I would just say we'll, we'll see when it starts, but it really feels like guys going to be, are going to be put in better spots overall. Yeah. I mean, we'll see about that. I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to hold my breath. What? Seems like it is, is how yeah, it seems it. like it. Like there's only so much we can extrapolate from a yeah. press conference, but it just definitely feels now like just kind of Paver Beek's body language, just up on that uh, podium with alongside Greg Cronin. It just feels like the ducks are much more like United front now, yes. right? Because that that's been the issue the last year. And it's just, it's just kind of a necessary step almost is that, Hey, you have a, a new GM who hasn't really put that much of a stamp on the organization. You have Roy Sommer who's on his last legs coaching down in the AHL. You have Dallas Sakins who's turned out to be a lame duck. And now you've got Matt McIlvain coaching down in San Diego, who is a Verbeek hire and who is, you know, I think a great AHL coach hire. I think he has potential to become a great NHL coach. And you have Greg Cronin, who's also coming from a different path. So you put all those things together, and it now feels like the version of the Ducks organization that Pat Verbeek maybe envisioned when he first joined the team or when he was signing up for this job, it, it's starting to come to fruition. Off the yeah. ice. Yeah. There's still a big part of this job that, that's left to be done, but the off-ice component is starting to look much, much more promising. Yeah, and really quickly before we get to our ad read, one other thing about that Galchenyuk portion is um... – Greg Cronin kind of said that, that that's kind of an example of what he likes to do and, and that or I, maybe it was him saying this for a week. I can't remember. But basically, you can coach up players. And you can coach up players to where they're going to improve. Um, and that's kind of what we talked about where this Ducks team should have been better last year and it almost felt like it was the inverse of that. Yeah. And I think what we're hearing from this is that hopefully we'll see the players actually be above what they were supposed to be uh, the, in this upcoming season. So... All right, so I think it's time for a word from our sponsor. Uh Uh-oh, Father's Day is right around the corner and you haven't gotten your dad anything yet. Don't worry, that's where the sponsors of today's show, Manscaped, comes in. Uh, You and I both know he needs some serious grooming in his life, 
So grab your dad the Performance Package 4.0 and he'll thank you for helping him tame his beast. It's a win-win situation for both mom and dad. Go to manscaped.com and use code CTP for 20% off plus free shipping. Uh, Manscaped is the only men's brand dedicated to below-the-waist grooming and perfected their game with the Lawnmower 4.0. Imagine surprising your dad with a sleek, well-designed, and optimized grooming kit that says, Your balls will thank you on the box. Uh, their fourth generation trimmer fe- features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents, uh, thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. You might ask, how is this lawnmower 4.0 different from other trimmers? Well, this upgraded trimmer includes a multifunction on off switch that can engage a travel lock. Uh, this is a great feature. If your father or yourself do a lot of traveling, it also gives you the ability to turn the 4,000 K led spotlight on and off, uh, when needed for a more precise shave. You can now shave your balls in the dark. Uh, the lawnmower 4.0 even allows you to customize your trim through additional guard lengths, which with sizes one through four. Have you ever seen a nose nose bush sticking out of your dad's nose? Well, with the weed whacker for, weed whacker 2.0, nose and ear hair trimmer is the uh, best nose uh, hair trimmer on the market and the perfect gift gift for your pops. Uh, they also have an, uh, other amazing products like cologne, crop mop, wall, ball wipes. Crop Reviver, Ball Toner, and Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. Get your dad a gift that you know they will use. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code CTP. Don't forget that you came from your dad's balls. This year, show your original home some love with Manscaped. Well. Thank you. Is that even accurate biologically? Yes. Anyway. I think so. Anyway. Don't answer what that. A, what an ad read. Don't try to answer that. Um, so let's get into the real reason I love the Greg Cronin hiring. Yeah. He admitted on that podcast that he is a an avid surfer. A massive, yeah. massive surfer. And it I, happened, I, I mean, must have been in his late 20s or probably 30s, whenever it was that he was with the Islanders. So maybe even later than that, probably 40s. He basically said, "I people are at a loss for words from the ad read, by the way. I'm looking That's at good. the Twitch and YouTube chat. They, they're at a loss for words right now. Sorry, folks. That was a good one. Um, but uh, he learned it when he was in New York because I guess there's a big surfing culture on the island there. And since then, he said he has surfed uh, He has surfed in Peru. He surfed in Taiwan. He surfed in uh, Korea. He surfed all over the place. And he even mentioned that uh, because he, he knows Paul Korea from, uh, from the main days, he surfed with them out here. And he's like, a couple weeks ago when there was the massive swell, he surfed at San Onofre with Paul Korea. And it hit me. Two weeks ago, I was supposed to go to San Onofre, got there too late, and the parking lot was full. You could have had the scoop. I could have had the scoop. I could have been there in the water with Paul Korea and uh, Greg Cronin. But um, the other thing he just like casually dropped, um, and I was just floored by it. He said last summer he was out in Hawaii when they had a massive swell come in and it was like 30 foot overhead. He's like, yeah, I was out there when it was 15 foot overhead. But after that, it was too big for me. Like 15 foot, like a 15 foot waves, huge. Yeah, that's massive. That is insane. Like when I'm out there and it's six feet, I get sketched out and I'm, Wait, I'm he, fine. He's, he's surfing. How many? How, how, how tall? It was a 15 foot tall wave. He surfed in Hawaii. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, he must be good at surfing. I yeah, I would assume so. Or I don't just, know. Or just, or a, just little crazy. a little crazy. I mean, probably, but still, I was just floored. Like, and just the way he like casually dropped it, and like Guy Bear and, and Kent French didn't really question it. And I'm like, he's saying he was out there in 15 foot waves. That's not any like. I mean, he kind of has this like, like I say this in the best way possible, but like kind of like this like psycho energy. Where it's yeah. like every, everything he does, he's just gonna go balls to the wall. He he mentioned it on that podcast that he's like, yeah, I I was married at one point. I had to I got divorced. Don't have kids, so I just put all my energy in being active in hockey. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> okay. It all makes sense now. Every, every now people in the Twitch chat is like, Jake would uh, be in love if Cronin was an AEW fan. <laughs> yeah. So. We we should we should get Derek to ask him about pro wrestling. Yeah, De- Derek, make that happen, please. Whenever you listen to this, just ask him if he's a wrestling fan at all. 
Yeah. But. So I think overall, though, this is just a fantastic hire. It, it checks all the boxes for me of an, an of an outside the beaten path coach saying all the right things. I like I said it over and over when people would ask. I don't really have someone in mind. I just have characteristics in mind. And yes. the Ducks met all of those, I think, to a T. Um, you know, and I think the fact that they have McIlvain down in down in the AHL is also very positive. So you put that, it all together. That was what? also something Pat Verbeek mentioned. He he they asked him kind of about Matt McIlvain and Greg Cronin and how they would kind of line up. And he said their methodologies are basically a yin and yang, like or not yin and yang. They 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 really mesh well together, and they're very similar. They work so well together. Wait, that is yin and yang. That is what I was. Yes. To do. Um, but and so he's like, there are some small differences, but at the end of the day, they are both in the same boat about the way they want the team to play, and it kind of goes with what we had said that the way that. Uh, Matt Malkavane has a team playing. You could imagine that the head coach that they were going to hire for the Ducks was going to be in a similar vein. Yeah, and and now I mean, I wouldn't. This is not by any means. I would say the biggest order of business for the Ducks this summer, but it was a very high priority item for Pat Verbeek. He passes this test, and here's the thing: I've been burned before you know, speaking glowingly about a coach the day he was hired and going off of press conference comments. So I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but it looks good. That's what we can say right now. We'll see how it plays out, but this does feel different than Dallas Aikens in part because I think, you know, Dallas Aikens had a very interesting ride in Edmonton. And at the time we kind of dismissed that a little bit and Maybe in hindsight, we shouldn't have, right? Yeah. I mean, different situation, a lot of mitigating factors. But with Greg Cronin, there isn't really that skeleton in the closet, right? It, it just... For better or to, worse. For better or worse, right? And, and so I am I am just intrigued. I am curious to see what happens next. And just overall, I think excited. I think that that's, that's really all I can really say. Unless you have... I mean, what, what, what's kind of your bottom line here? Uh, bottom line is that I am very excited by this hiring. And it's funny because when it was announced this morning, I kind of went like, oh, because I, I think coming into this, all yeah. we really heard was kind of some, uh, something that he was a defensive coach. Yeah. And, and that we didn't really know a whole lot about him. And I think as the day has gone on, as we've heard him speak more, as we've seen more and more put out about him, as Pat Verbeek spoke, and as we, we get all these snippets it just goes from being O oh, to being oh, this is gonna be great, and getting very very excited for it. And it's like the Vince McMahon gif, where he's just have to bring bring that man up. Why not wrestling? He's awful. He's awful. I thought you like wrestling. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, but no, because it, it's just and you you hear like old school coach all is like, I feel like that was a lot of the stuff that you heard kind of instantly right away this morning was old school coach, defensive things like that. Or maybe that's what we were hearing over the last couple of weeks. If Greg Cronin wasn't announced, but everything kind of we've heard today is the exact opposite of that. I, I think there are some old school mentalities to him, but everything else is understanding what new school has to be. Yeah, exactly. And it sounds well and good. I think we should probably reserve judgment from, from here on out, but I, I, I do want to quickly add that when, it, when people have asked me today, like, who is the Ducks' new coach, and I tell them and they, like, have no clue, I'm almost like, that's a good thing. Yeah. It's good, it's good that that's the reaction. It's like, oh, who is that? Instead of, oh, you know, Peter well, Laviolette or John Mike Hunt, Babcock. Mike Babcock. It's just like... Who fact, suppose, supposedly, I guess the Ducks never actually interviewed. So there's that. So good news there. So, and again, just not, I, I can't really stress enough how just not going for a retread just seems to be a positive value decision for a lot of teams. I mean, look at, uh, look at the Tampa Bay Lightning, John Cooper, when they hired him, not a retread. And that worked out pretty well for them. So I think that today's a good day for optimism. For Ducks fans, but from here on out, it's just wait and see to see how it plays out. 
Yeah, and I think it's going to be fascinating because it seems like this is one of the things that just popped in my head on this. I mean, just from everything they said, it seems like him and Pat Verbeek have a really, uh, really good re- uh, rapport together. And it seems like they just enjoy yeah. they enjoy riffing off of each other. Um, I and, think and that they, they're I think they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Like they yeah. seem to be cut from a similar cloth. And I feel like even though obviously he's not going to have a say in players that come in or have the final say, I feel like he's going to have a pretty decent say in the players they're looking at though. Well, and one thing to add too, you know, with this whole analytics aspect, I mean, we forget that Jeff Solomon is still a part of this organization. And the Ducks hired so many different people last summer to help build information. Like the Ducks have made analytics a much bigger priority than it's been. It's still like if you you can go on their website and look at team staff, like it's still not this big department. But they've hired people in the hockey operations department to to work on analytics. And Jeff Solomon has a voice in this leadership group. I mean, it's not just Pat Verbeek, right? It's Martin Madden, Jeff Solomon, Pat Verbeek, and so I feel like. We, we've kind of gotten away from that because there's been so much stuff, other stuff to talk about, but this is maybe also a little bit of an evidence of a Jeff Solomon influence as well, because this guy, Greg Cronin, checks boxes for everyone, it seems, in that leadership group, right? You have Haverbeek's kind of hard-nosed, I want someone who's going to be tough, and then you also have the more analytics-savvy side, so everyone probably in that room comes away feeling pretty good about the hire, and that's important too. You want it. You want a united front. I did want to also add, though, that on the development front, I think the fact that, you know, Pat Verbeek really dialed in on development. I don't know. how. Do you think that that says anything about where he sees this team right now? Because to me, what it says is, hey, maybe they're they're going to try to take a step. But also, this isn't a finished product. There's still guys on this team and that are going to come in that are going to need to keep developing, even as the Ducks now try to be competitive again. Yeah. And I think that's fair. One of the interesting things actually is, sorry, as I've said, things well, just I keep coming in. My question, but that's fine. No, no, I'm not going to. Cause I have something way more interesting, way more <laughs> interesting thing to bring up. Uh, I think there was a point in the, the press conference today where Greg Cronin kind of said that he's like, it's my job to get more out of these guys. And he's like, I think yeah. that this can be a better team. And yeah. Kind of, and I, I want to get more out of these guys. I want to have the young guys here. I want to have them play more. And kind of Pat Verbeek kind of put a little cold water on that because he's more or less saying we're still in this long rebuild or yeah. not long rebuild, but he he more or less said we're going through this slow process and we're not going to jumpstart it just because of that. But it seems like Greg Cronin is kind of where you and I are at with this team that they should have been better last year. Yeah. They should not have been where they were at. And yeah. it sounded like from that quote, he agreed with that. He thought he could get a lot more out of them. Well, I think that that could be just a bit of expectation managing. by From Verbeek. Verbeek. Yeah. But at the same time, I do think that it kind of goes both ways. I think Pat Verbeek probably still thinks that this team has a lot of work left to do to become competitive just internally. But you also want to bring in a coach who's going to see the opportunity. Who's not going to be like, well, you know, we're just going to have to uh, start thinking about next year before next year's, you know, but there's still a full season left to play. You want a coach who's going to come in and actually think, okay, how can we speed this up? How can I make these guys better? Because ultimately that's what's going to move the ball downfield. Yeah. So, I mean, it's his job to do that. It's his job to get more out of this team. And, and that's, and I love that tone that he's setting because to me, that's what, I mean, quite frankly, that's what Dallas Higgins failed at. That's what Dallas yep. Akins, I won't say ran from, but Dallas Akins did not own really the development aspect and how can I get the most out of these players aspect. At especially least especially at least in the talk inter- about it as much. Especially in the interviews, I think, after the season. I mean, his like media car wash that he's been doing. It's he it's kind of been a fallback of we were a rebuilding team. There's been a lot of the interviewers doing a lot of excuse making for him and him not necessarily poo pooing any of the excuses yeah. and some are valid, but at the same time, I think that you want someone like a Greg Cronin, Cronin who's going to be like, Hey, 
I want to come in and own this thing. I want to make guys better. I think that is my job. That is why I'm here. And instead it's like, well, we were rebuilding. We traded everyone at the deadline. So what am I supposed to, it's just like, that's not, that. that's why the, that's in part why the ducks are where they are right now and why last season went the way it did. Yep. All right. Want to get to questions or anything else you want to add? Well, I did want to quickly touch on, unless this comes up in questions, but this is not ducks news, but it does have to do with the ducks in part. Cole Caulfield, Signing his eight-year, seven. We also have one other thing we should probably get to. So go on. But so seven point eight five million dollars a year, uh, AV for Cole Caulfield, eight years, and I think that to me what this says is that Trevor Zegers is probably going to get close, very close, if not past eight million dollars a year for eight years if he gets that eight-year deal. Yep, which is where uh, Evolving Wild has him, or Evolving Hockey has him. Yeah, I think they have think, him like an eight times eight point two five or something like that, something yeah. in that range. And, and I just want to make it clear because I think I, I put this out there this morning when the Caulfield news dropped that hey, this is this probably means that's where the number is going to be for Zegers. And I got some replies saying, well, you know, he's he hasn't proved that he's worth that kind of contract yet. He's only got sixty points a year type thing, and. Here's the thing. When you sign these young players to these types of contracts, you're not paying them exclusively, almost, you're paying them on potential. You're paying them for what they're going to do, for the improvement that they're going to achieve in that prime. Because really that stretch between 22 to 20 to 30, or however you want to delineate that, that is really that player's prime. And so what you're doing is, yes, you're going to pay top dollar for maybe a couple of years where it might seem like an overpay, but it's going to end up being a bargain for the team. Those are team friendly deals because the player hasn't actually doesn't have full proof of concept yet. The, the, the team understands that he's going to get there. And so they want to lock him up early, yeah. right? Because ideally for a player, what you would do is take a bridge deal. Trevor Zegers, let's say next year has a hundred points. He can come back to the bargaining table and have probably a stronger argument for a, a bigger payday. Yeah. But there's the flip side of that, the other side of the coin, which is, hey, you can just have eight years now and have, you know, locked in security, 60 plus million dollars. Just you're going to get that. And so I understand why it might be some confusing for some, but that is the reason why teams do it. And that is the reason why players do it as well. And that's where the market is at with these high RFA or with these RFAs. And that's where, uh, well, you're right. That is about uh, where they're going to go. The previous production does play a part in it a little bit yes. because that I mean, kind of helps. Trevor set- Zegers is not getting that those numbers just purely on potential. He has shown already that he's at worst like a second line forward center in the NHL. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, to me, the two options are he either takes an eight-year deal at this 8.25 or he does a two-year deal in around four and a half, I think, is something like that, where Evolving has evolving hockey as not projected and then he'll be able to renegotiate after two years um and, and get a potentially a bigger deal um yeah. so we'll see where that ends up um but i mean it's funny because all of his uh national development team friends getting eight years so curious if that has any play in it um yeah. and then the other piece of news well not piece of news but information that's come out is frank cervelli put out his uh trade bait type board Oh, and yeah. he has uh he has John Gibson on there and has and not only has John Gibson on there but had a bit of information on that and said that basically John Gibson has let the ducks know that he is ready for a change of scenery and Lisa Dillman added color to that information in her own reporting saying that the, that he met that Gibson met with the ducks i think it was last month had to have been last month because we're just started the new month, but, and that they, they had this discussion that this was something that did happen between player and team. And it's not necessarily between, you know, third parties or whatever. Um, so the fact that Frank Valley came out and said that, and that Lisa Dillman came out and said that, you know, who's very close to the team and she's not going to say stuff necessarily. That the team doesn't want her to say. So you put that all together and, the, the, the fire is getting hotter. The flames are getting yeah. brighter. And, and Frank kind of said this on the, he had a podcast last week where he briefly mentioned this, but he kind of said, he's like, whether it was a tr- official trade request or unofficial trade request, semantic conversation doesn't matter really too much. He's like, all that matters is 
he's told him that he's ready for a move. That he wants to go to a place where he can compete now. That's what he wants to happen. Well, and I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, and, and so it really doesn't matter how you want to dive into it because I know that there was a lot of that throughout of like, well, he still hasn't put in an official trade request. He wants out. And this doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be moved. This doesn't mean that it's going to happen, but it's a pretty clear statement. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that you can debate whether this actually means he asked to be traded or what have you, but at the end of the day, it shows where his intentions are and where his where his head is at. Yep. Which is which is that he's more or less done with with being an Anaheim Duck. And I think that's kind of all we can really say for now. We we still don't really know. We don't have any other information on you know other cuz cuz this is the thing, right? Is now if you want to go down all the way down that rabbit hole, trading John Gibson is no easy feat. He's got term no. left. There's money on that deal. You're not selling him at the top of his value by any stretch. And so this is going to be a complicated deal to work out for the Ducks, but I'm going to stick to my guns with the the opinion I've had this entire time, which is that just getting out of the contract alone, whether you have to retain or not, I think to me is valuable because of the way John Gibson is trending and what you can do with that to the, what you can do with the remaining added cap space to improve your team as you climb up. Yeah. And supposedly this is from Frank. Also the ducks were asking for a lot last summer for Gibson. And so Which, make, you know, make it try to get the most. As, as, yeah. As and beat autos. I, I know we'll get to more questions, but this is relevant. He's like, can we get your guys in, uh, in the record for a framework framework of a Gibson deal? And one that came to mind as we were doing a Patreon episode a little bit ago is I think you have to take a goalie back. That's a bad money goalie. I think that's in some ways a necessity for this. And then you use that kind of taking the money back to get uh, a younger winger if you can. And so the one that this is just purely theoretical, but a framework for a deal that I came that came to my head was trading him to the Kings, getting Cal Peterson back, let less money slightly by million, less years, two years less. And you get Arthur Kaliev also. And so you yeah. add You add a higher end winger to your top six that the ducks do need that fits the aging window of their team. And they're taking money back to make the money work. And they get a goalie. If they can somehow resuscitate Cal Peterson's career, they have a veteran backup goalie. Yeah. I mean, I think it would, it's not, I don't think it's going to be a super sexy return. You know, I haven't really fully dived into what that would look like. I would be kind of shocked if, if a team parted with a player of Kaliev's ilk to take on Gibson. Depends on how they view Gibson. It does. And that's the other thing that is kind of the missing piece here. Um, The Ducks asked for a lot last summer and didn't get it. So clearly whatever their expectations were, it's going to be a little lower than that. If they can get that type of return, though, let's just say that they did your hypothetical trade. I think that's a good outcome. You improve your current roster. You get out of the contract. Like you said, maybe you can resuscitate Cal Peterson. I think that that's probably what it's going to end up looking like because it's not going to be like Gibson for picks because there's going to have to be money moved around to make this work. Yeah. And I'm trying to recall what there was a report about the teams that like, this is a previous report that he would say yes to. I know LA was one of them. I know Pittsburgh was one of them. And he think he has a 10 team, no trade list, but, um, I can't recall what the third team would have been. Maybe it was the devils. Um, so just something to keep in mind. I, I think that L I remember LA and Pittsburgh for sure. And Pittsburgh may not have a goalie and Kyle Dubas is their new, uh, ho- uh, president of hockey ops. And so depending on how he views that, I mean, Florida, he don't, we, we don't know if maybe he was interested in Gibson and Toronto and because of how long things had to go up the, the totem pole, yeah. it never happened or it got nixed by uh, MLSE. So who knows? Um, So let's get to anything else or want to get to questions. Questions. All right. We're going to start with our discord. Then we're going to go to Twitter and then we'll get to Twitch and YouTube. So Appa asks, uh, Oh, whoops. That was uh, not a question. Pancake breakfast. Please said, what beer is Jake going to be forced to buy me when Oliver Moore gets drafted by Gabe Perot Uh, gets drafted before Gabe Perot. This is a, a bet that Connor and I have, uh, it's going to be dealer's choice. We'll figure it out when the time comes. Uh, D-Rock Lee said, Jake, if you could surf anywhere in the world with Greg Conan, 
where would you and why? And Dejan said, when will you go surfing with good old Greg Crony? Um, I'm just going to go with a nice local spot here. Let's go hit up Trestles, have some fun at uppers, maybe go to churches. I stay away from lowers because people are very good there and I'm not that good. Um, maybe we go to churches. We, we kind of chill, have some fun. Maybe go down to Sano, hit, hit up some real South OC good spots. South OC? You mean, yeah. you mean North SD? I actually sent it over his North SD. So fair point. Bingo. So fair. Um, all right. Uh, Matt said, will Cronin bench Zegris more or less than Aikens did? I mean, I would say just don't assume that this is going to look like, don't assume that those things are just not going to happen anymore. Is what I would say. But flip side of that. Trevor Zegers is probably going to come in next season a much, much richer man, taking up a much, much bigger chunk of the salary cap. And I think he's going to be an improved player. So I just don't think that's going to happen as much for a bunch I, of different reasons. Agreed. Mighty for nothing said is Greg Cronin him. Uh, yes. Uh, Shaken wing. Sorry. I'm not quite sure what the question is here. Cause he's saying what type of players forward or defense speed, skill, big, small. So not really sure what that was. about. Uh, good. good, good, good players. Uh, numero uno Adamo Fantilli fan said, who are the next drafting at second overall? No waffling or hedging. They're taking Adam Fantilli. Leo Carlson. Wow. Where there's did smoke, just, there's fire. Did you just do that to be different? I believe it in my heart of hearts. No, you don't. Uh, Jeffrey K said, should the Ducks sign Ivan Barbashev if the price is right? I've been liking his style of play on the wing. No, because my he issue, my, he's hot right now. That's what I was going to say. I, I think the issue with Ivan Barbashev there is that he's going to have that playoff bump where I he's going to be paid a lot a more than he should. There's a reason teams really wanted him at the deadline, but that's just, he's gonna, kind of, that's just the kind of contract the Ducks shouldn't be signing right now. Yeah. Uh, numero uno Hadama Fantelli Fen also said, and Jake, what is the least amount of money you would take to eat four scrambled egg, four eggs scrambled? I won't know. I'm not. No. Wow. No. You wouldn't even I, do it no. for money? No. Okay, a million dollars. Wow. Um, okay. Pancake Pancake bref, Breakfast uh, Plutie said, what are both of your plans for the draft? Beer choice, food choice. Will Jake be holding Luke in his right or left arm? Um, I don't really have a plan. I'll probably be driving home when it happens. Beer choice. I've been really on an Ashland hard seltzer kick lately. The tropical cherries, so good. Um, that or uh, Buena Vesa Cerveza. What time is the draft at? I don't know. Like 4 p.m.? Stupid That's too bad. Maybe I'll maybe I'll be I'll come back to the Eastern Time <laughs> Zone. Maybe you'll go back to Montreal for it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't really, I don't usually like party for the draft. I I like to be like in the zone as I'm watching it. You know, keeping track of Twitter and whatnot. So yeah, water, sparkling um, water. I'm gonna go with Luke will be my left arm because Adam Fantilli is a left hand shot. Okay, I don't know. That was the question. Uh... Lou said, FDR once said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Oscar Wilde famously w was quoted in saying, always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. What has been your worst dining experience in the last few weeks? What was that preface even for? What did that accomplish? I mean, Lou is just coming up with so many of these, and it's impressive. I'm impressed. My favorite dining experience? A oh, worst dining worst. experience. In the last few weeks. Uh, hmm. I had one. And I can't remember what it was. I mean, being in Montreal and trying different food places, there's definitely been some misses. I was at a, a Jewish deli type place called Chinoy yesterday. And uh, I had a steak and eggs. And the steak I got was supposedly flank, flank steak. And it was, let's just say it was well done. Let's just say that there wasn't really any color when you slice through except gray. And uh, that was a little bit disappointing. What was my worst dining? I'm just going to go with this. It's not, it was a while ago now, but I was really craving uh, chicken shawarma. 
Okay. And ordered it. Swarma was fine. The rice was overcooked, though. Hmm. The like rice hard? is... Yeah. I'm like, how can you do that? So, I'll go with I guess that. that would be undercooked. Oh, undercooked. Oh, Monica, like hard, like, yeah. Monica just opened the door to correct me and say undercooked. Oh, wow. Look at us. Yeah. Same wavelength. Yeah, exactly. So, there's that. Yeah. She got roasted. Uh, I did. That's how wrong you were. She felt compelled I, to open the door. She, o- she opened the door and corrected me. That's what happened. Uh, plant, plant Wrench uh, said, what's the probability you think Mitchov goes seventh or later? Um, and is there a deal you think the Ducks could make to get him in that spot? No. No. I don't think anyone's... I mean, I don't think anyone would trade with the Ducks to move down because they're second first... Do the Ducks even have a second first? No. Right now? Yes, they do. It's going to be low. It's going to be very low. Like, I'm on one screen right now. This is not my usual big monitor, multiple screens. So I'm going off of memory. I don't think any team would be willing to move down that far to for the Ducks to get into that mix. And I just don't think it'd be really worth it at that point. Yeah. Um, and he said, also favorite hockey toys as a kid. Ooh, um, I had these, uh, like, Mc- did you ever hear of the McFarlane action figure? Like, they're like, these, like, hockey figures made by this, like, no. comic book artist. McFarlane, I forget the first name, but, yeah, I had those in my room. I had a, I forget who I had. I had a Wayne Gretzky. I had a Jose Theodore. Um, you know, just legends of the game. I remember having the Mighty Ducks cartoon action figures. And they would shoot. They would oh, have. Oh, like, I had those too. You would shoot hockey pucks. I had those too. Yeah, those are good. Yeah. Um, let's see. Lactic said Cronin is a hockey lifer. And apparently, has been considered for several uh, head coaching jobs. Aside from the run of the mill answer about the coach roulette, do you have any ideas why he hasn't been hired before? Uh, I guess my question is why should we temper our expectations? I mean, that's a great question. I honestly don't know. <laughs> I mean, here's here's kind of my answer to that. And yeah. it's funny because Greg Cronin kind of mentioned this about in some ways, so much about hockey is knowing the right people. Yeah. And, and he's like, it's funny that he's like, Pat for and I really didn't have many connections besides one person, but I got my foot in the door and really kind of jumped in and was able to get it in or get in there and do that. Yeah. But I feel like so much of it is, a, is so much of it is about the connections that you make and, it's almost not about your skills. It's about who you're friends with. Yeah. I mean, look at Marty St. Louis. He yeah. gets to be a head coach with zero professional hockey coaching experience because he was friends with Kent Hughes. I mean, that's just how it works. And yeah, I think sometimes it's just like you said, why did, it's why did Randy Carlisle get a second job in Anaheim? Yeah. I think that we shouldn't hold that. I mean, I don't think the person's holding it against him, but I think, that's not necessarily a bad indicator because there's, there's coaches who get to stick around and that's not necessarily a positive indicator. So how old was Bruce, Bruce Boudreaux when he got his first coaching job or first NHL? He must've been in his sixties. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. He, so there you go. He's currently, let's see. He's current. No, it would have been, he's 68 right now. Okay. But still like fifties. Yeah. Cause when did, when did he? 2008, 2007. 2007. So 15 years. So, yeah, so, I mean 53. Yeah. So, so, yeah. I mean, that's still a long time to be coaching. Yeah. And Yeah, because have- same thing. He was coaching for a long time, worked his way through all the different minor leagues. Yeah, and um, look, how that worked. look how that worked out. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't I don't think it should necessarily be held against him. Okay. Um, Let's see. Hey, Odifo said, why in the world did Felix eat lobster for dinner this evening? You ate lobster? Yeah. Yeah. Staying with some family friends uh, in northern Quebec. And yeah, they made us lobster. It was fantastic. That's impressive. I am very jealous. I don't know why, what Mike's like purpose of that question there was, but... Lobster I'm... is much cheaper here than... Wait, why is he saying just shameful? I'm very confused. Lobster's great. Why, why, are, we sh- yeah, him... why are we shaming lobster? Him and Ferda were hating on lobster, and I'm just like, why? Why I are mean, we why are we hating on lobster? Lobster is amazing. I mean, I hate on crab, so maybe that's why. But lobster and crab are both great. 
they're both good. I mean, crab is fine. It's just too much work to eat, but lobster <laughs> is great. Like 91 Pluto is saying how northern is northern Quebec? This is actually not that they they call it in French they call it le nord, like the north. Like Oh, so north. so you're in Toronto. No, no, they call <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. But they call that it took you a second. They, they call it Don Nav, and I'm thinking, oh, like that sounds far, and it, this is like an hour north of Montreal. So, all right, we, we have more questions forest. to get this through. Is, this is in the forest, though. <laughs> Ducks Jag- Jagger said, "With Caulfield's contract being finalized, what do we think uh, Zegra sees, and is he is his signing the next top priority uh, active business this off season?" I think so. I think yeah. I think you you got to lock down the future. Yep. Plant Red said, uh, what are the milestones metrics of success you're looking for from Cronin this year? I'd say Honestly, above 50% expected goals for percentage. I mean, that's a good one. Something as just, simple as that. But I'm going to look at it this way. Um, because they, I mean, they, they, this is what they sold him on is development. So how do the younger players look? How do they develop? Yeah. That's what I'm going to be looking for. Yep. Uh, Lactic also just summed in Alex Faust is out for the broadcast, uh, out of the broadcast for the LA Kings. Any chance he joins the Anaheim broadcast? I doubt it. I doubt it. Also the fact that John Allers was just on the ducks, uh, duck stream podcast. I I think that if there was a change coming there, we would have heard it, heard about it already. But I mean, John Allers is better. So no worries. What? No need. Alex Faust is one of the best play by play guys out there. So Johnny, uh, I don't understand what the Kings are thinking there, but I mean, well, it's because it's because of the whole Bally situation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they don't, they don't have a contract. His contract was expiring. Well, and I think that they're, the Kings don't actually have a rights holder for next year. Yeah. So I think this is just them kind of downsizing basically. So yeah. Not um, downsizing, but like, kind of yeah. Like, and I looked it up. The, the Ducks in 2014 had a 10 year extension. So they're either in the final year or there's one more year after this with Fox Sports and with how things are going. Who knows if that's even continued? Yeah. I mean, so, what, what's going on with the Padres? They were. You know how they, the Padres well, had their last v- broadcast on Bally. Well, Vegas next season because they got. They, they aren't with Bally, but what was it? Eight, whatever the. AT and T Sportsnet that just went kaputs, I think, um, and so they actually bought their rights back, and they're going to broadcast. I think on a local channel and stream it for free. Wow. All their home games, yeah, it's a big deal. So they're yeah. they're doing that. So it's still local blackouts. Be if you're so you can't watch it on ESPN Plus if you're in that area. You have to do it on that free stream. Um, that but yeah, uh, Plant Wretch is saying yeah, Padres are being broadcast by the MLB for free. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, all right. So we had a bunch of questions on Twitter that came in, and I'm just going to have to go to my DMs because that is the easiest way for me to find questions. Uh, this came from Sean Siebold. Will Sasha Pasijov play over 200 games in the NHL? Whew, what a question. I'm going to be optimistic and say yes, but deep down I think no. Okay. Uh Trevor Zebra said, uh, do you guys think Cronin's development history is good or will become good? Haven't heard much about him, so I'm not trying to make it seem like he's a bad coach. I just don't know uh, too much about him with the likes of Zegris, Fantilli, McTavish, Selweger on his hands. I really hope he can turn them into elite players, uh, which uh, they all have the talent to become. Um, I think it's good. I think everything we've heard is good. Um, Let's see. When McIlvain and Cronin got introduced, the jersey on their number was 23 uh it the reason it's number 23 is because it's the year of 2023 yeah it's that simple yeah nothing to read into and then said rubik was asked the question do you know who you're taking at number two his response was i think so do you think fantilli is the guy or do you think the world championship hurt or helped his case i think fantilli is the guy i think i think king leo will soon be the king of anaheim i think it it's adam fantilli i mean if you were to put together a player that i think fits what Verbeek wants. It's Adam Fantilli. Leo Carlson. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, let's see. 
I think that's it for that. So anyone who wants to start throwing in questions in Twitch and in YouTube, start putting them in there. So for those of you listening on your favorite podcast services, uh, we do a live stream of the show each and every time. You can find us at twitch.tv slash crash pond where you have, if you have Amazon prime, you get one free Twitch prime gaming sub each and every month. It does help more than you can imagine. You can be just like shoegaze, uh, dragon, Georgie, who resubbed, uh, for 51 months and Dan Grimshaw, Grimshaw who resubbed for 26 months. So thank you so much for that. Or you can find us at YouTube, go to youtube.com slash crash spawn where you can subscribe to our channel. We are trying to really boost our subscribers. Please. If you enjoy listening to your show and you use YouTube, I know we all do. Everyone uses YouTube. Go subscribe to the channel. It's just one click like the videos. It helps out more than you can imagine getting us more visibility. Um, all right, so we got these questions. Goons, Goons Never Say Die chimed in with, question, what is Felix's thoughts on Caulfield's contract? I love it. It's a, okay. it's a, it's a good deal for both sides, I think. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I think the thing I like from all this is there's no more of the the BS that we saw a lot with Bob Murray and the Ducks and just from that era and that ilk when you saw with Getzloff Perry that it's almost like your second contract was like a prove-it contract. It was always like a three-year, four-year yeah. mini bridge in some ways. I think Caulfield almost because I think Evolving Hockey had him projected at six point seven on eight years, and I think he got more than that. But I think that this number makes more sense just given his production and his status. Yeah, so, yeah. and, and it point. could be a, it could be recent, not recency bias in a bad way, but He's almost writing off the. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right, writing off that first first part of the last season on, under Dom Ducharme. Um, yeah. So yeah, there could be that. Uh, Beatle said, "Question: Is a hot dog a sandwich?" Yes. No. It's meat between bread. No. That's a sandwich. That's a burger is a sandwich. A burger is a sandwich. A burger is a burger. A burger is a. A burger is a type of sandwich. It's in the sandwich family, just like a hot dog is in the sandwich family. To be a sandwich, the bread needs to be separate. What about a sub? What about a hoagie? Oh, not a, That's a hoagie. It's not a sandwich. Uh, wait, what? That's its own category. It's a category of a sandwich, though. No, it's, it's like... Um... How is this still a question? This is like a five or six year old question and it's still people get it wrong like you we should continue we should a hot dog on. it's a sandwich meat between bread so what you're saying is that a veggie sandwich is not a sandwich a veggie it, it's still yes it's a sandwich it, no, it's con- your definition oh. fails a hot dog is a sandwich a veggie is a burrito, sandwich is a burrito a sandwich i mean that that's a good question I would say a burrito, a burrito is questionable. I think a burrito is a burrito. The absurdity of your <laughs> wait did, did we did didn't we do this once and you got yourself in hot water about the burrito in a sandwich? Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, I should probably hear the burrito talk. Oh, what a great bit! What a great bit! Um, <laughs> let's see. Ducks Dragonaut says, "Can Felix reread the Manscaped ad in French for his Montreal friends and family?" We uh, read it for your dad in French. Yeah, maybe I'll try. See how okay. that goes. Okay. Um, Plant Rich said, if we take Fantilli, what line do you think he'd be on? Uh, I feel like he would start on the third line. Just gut feel. Yeah, I feel but like- I think it's it's not going to be third line in the sense of, I, I think there, he'll be better surrounded. I think from an order yeah. perspective, yes. I, I think that, yeah, like, you know, Zegers and McTavish are the presumptive kind of 1A, 1B situation and then i think fantilli is kind of is in his own mix there where i think he would i mean he's he'd be a teenager in the nhl like you know as great as greg conan sounds like teenagers in the nhl have to work their way up usually and so yep. i mean he is fantastic and there is a chance that he just he he defies all of this but if i were to just guess i think it, he'd start third line yeah. Uh, Louis X209 said, question, what's the funniest bit in the CTP Discord history? There was one wow. the other week that was really funny, and I can't remember it now. I don't know. I don't know. Because they're I mean, changing. They're, they're today, you thinking that COVID-20 was a thing was really funny. That oh, got it's me. not? 
<laughs> I don't I don't think so, but okay. you, you you thought everyone was being serious. I mean, I'm just very like on edge stuff. So like you guys were playing ears, <laughs> which I didn't appreciate, but yeah, I can't I think just, I, I, I think my, my favorite bit is the one that I started. Of course. And, well, it's not really I didn't start it because it's the one that I implemented maybe the earliest, but I think it probably originated from the Anaheim calling Slack was just like dropping into the chat. Like, are we sure about X? <laughs> and then that just starting uh, just an avalanche of conversation. <laughs> you might've been the first one to say that for all I know, but I, I, think, I don't think so. But are we sure about X? And then just like, like today I put in, in the chat, like, are we sure about San Diego as a concept? <laughs> <laughs> it's just shit like that it's just so dumb but it's hilarious to me so yeah i don't think that i think that's funny for you there was a bit the other uh, me and lou today doing a, ba- a song that no one else really got also was a good bit it is, so. it's not a bit if no one else gets it i mean if me and lou got it then it's a good bit that's all that matters um so uh mighty for nothing said uh how tired is felix because it's past midnight you know, this is actually the first night, I want to say, where I, maybe the second night, I'm actually feeling it a little bit. Like, I'm actually wow. feeling like normal, how I would normally feel at midnight, because I've been going to bed. Oh, uh, what? Appa just came in with the best bit. Well, anyway, one... I, just, I just want to close the loop by saying that I've been going to bed at like 3 to 4 a.m. because we're three hours ahead here. And uh, today is the first era. I'm like, there's no way in hell I'm making it until like. Who I am. So, um, the best bit was when we talked about Brent Burns being part of the Civil War, and then yeah, we had conversations about all the different wars, and that was, that was a journey. That 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 was, that was Radko a- Gud- Radko Gudis also was a, a war general. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, it that that was definitely the best day. I think one of the best bits on the the show. Or Fantastic. in the Discord. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mighty Full Hawk said, Ducks Cup anniversary tomorrow. How are we celebrating, gents? <laughs> Do you keep track of this stuff? June 6th. Do we respect the Ducks Cup win? Yeah, stop. <laughs> are, are, I thought you were about to go, are we sure about? Do we respect the Ducks Cup win? Ugh. All right. Beat Oddle <laughs> said, question, soda or pop? It's soda. It's soda. It's, it's soda. Uh, famous AEB says, who are your players uh, that take a step uh, next year? I'm just going to, I'm going to keep it nice and simple. Trevor Zegras. I think that he was in my top 10 franchise players in our blast Patreon pod. And maybe that was too high, but I, I think that there's so much, meat left on that bone i think that he he has so much room to improve and now that he's going to have hopefully a real de- coach that will actually try to develop him i i think he takes a big step i have a cat going crazy behind me right now um yeah uh so if you hear noise it's salem chasing a ball and going <laughs> absolutely wild over it uh b doddle said question is felix excited about a possible okada versus danielson match a what a what what uh, Brian Danielson versus that's, Kazuchika that's, Okada. That sounds like a natural disaster or something. It's going to be amazing. It's sold me the pay per view. I was going to buy the pay per view anyways, but Forbidden Door must watch pay per view for any wrestling fan. It's just going to be beautiful. Um, let's see. Uh, SES Per said uh, the South OC North OC bit is a top tier bit from Discord. That's correct. That one just makes me angry because because it's just. People are so dumb. And that is why it's a top tier bit. <laughs> okay. That's, I yeah. That's I, th- I think my favorite is uh, our good friend Green Bastard uh, trying to claim that Lake Forest is North OC. Mm, tough. That's a tough one. <laughs> I, won't, I won't choose a side. Wow. Um, I'm, leaving, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving Green Bastard uh, high and dry. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, no one agrees with him on that. <laughs> I, I'm always looking to defend the little guy, and in this instance, I'm, I'm just, 
I'm leaving you to the wolves. <laughs> no, Sorry. you're you never you never. Oh, uh, by the way, so lactic uh, lactic acid said uh, for the person that's going to improve the most, Ryan Strom. That's a good shout. Improve or play better, or is, are those the same <laughs> the, thing? The, I, those are the same thing. Well, because improve to me is like you're a young player who has not shown that yet. Whereas Ryan Strom has had good seasons and it's just like, yeah, I guess that wouldn't be take a step is how it was worded. So that's not taking a step, but I think he will have a much better year. And now you see my side. Yeah. So that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. uh, But Salem is going absolutely batshit behind me. Um, All right. Plant said, who would you pair Fantilli with? Hmm. Well, he's a high octane playmaking shooting dual threat type player with a lot of energy not necessarily the most two-way player so i'm thinking well who would be a good two-way player to kind of supplement him while also accentuating his offensive capabilities the ducks don't really have a lot of players like that i mean troy terry would be great next to him but you kind of need troy terry on every line right now for the ducks Mm-hmm. agreed I mean, oh why am I curious to see him Nikita Nesterenko? I don't know why. I'm just curious. Two tall, yeah. two tall players. I feel like that's a player I keep forgetting about. Him and Brock McGinn. Yeah. Man, I keep forgetting the great, that they're on this team. The, 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 how could you forget the great debate of why Brock McGinn was included in the, yeah. in the trade? Yeah. That I'm forgetting who was even involved with. Uh, it, w- it was, uh, it was the... Great. It was to Pittsburgh for um, I'm for already. Sp- it was for two picks. It right? was f- what? Why am I spacing on the player? Oh man, that we I traded. Don't think it was for a player. Yes, the Ducks traded. Um, oh, I, why can't I remember this guy's name? Kulikov. There we go. Pete Ottles. Oh. Thank you. I could oh, not. Yes. I could not. Re- now we have everyone in the Twitch and YouTube chat saying Kulikov. Hey, I could n- not figure out that name. Here. As it should be. So, <laughs> Dmitry Kulikov. There we go. That's where uh, you're supposed to come in and help me out, so I don't look as dumb. I forgot my my short term memory lately has been pretty pretty bad because I'm so tired. Yeah. All right. All right. I said we get on out of here. No more questions. No. No more oh, questions. Uh, B- Fatrell to- has a question, but it's more so for a future episode. If we could uh, put together an armchair GM Ducks roster for next year and share on a later podcast. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that. Maybe that'll be our Patreon this month. Yeah. Um, I have two things. Okay. Stanley Cup final. Where are you at? Um, cats in five. <laughs> yeah, your prediction died tonight. Um, it it died. Cats in and seven. Did you watch either game? Uh, I've watched bits and pieces. This series has not interested me. The games have been batshit. I don't know how else to put this. Yeah. But like tonight, for example, um, Matthew Kachuk gets. I saw the hit. Oh, sorry. No, he, did not he, see gets cro- he gets cross checked in front of the net um, by a, a Vegas defenseman behind the play. The referee is literally standing right there, right next to Matthew Kachuk, the Vegas defenseman, and Aiden Hill. He gets cross checked, falls into the net. Aiden Hill then goes out of his way to smack him with his stick, like slash him across the body with his stick. Referee is still standing right there. Zero call. It's it's as blatant of a penalty as you're ever going to see. And then, and I think that Florida was only down 2-0 at that point. And then, you know, Vegas goes, Vegas scores within 30 seconds of that play. And you look back to last game, at the end of game one, where all the fracas breaks out between the two yeah. teams, Matthew Kachuk gets tossed. In this game, Matthew Kachuk, I don't know if he got tossed, but he took two misconducts. Yeah, he got two 10-minute misconducts. It's just... Which the first misconduct was dumb. Like, I'm all for protecting players, and everyone knows that. That, was, that wasn't that was just a, like, this is a legal hit by the rule book. That's a clean hit no matter what. Eichel stumbled into the hit. It was shoulder on shoulder. So is that what they gave it to him for? I think so. He never actually said what the misconduct was for because he got a roughing penalty and a misconduct. Yeah, so they, you can give a misconduct in addition to, so, so yeah. 
I hate I hate to say this, but the officiating is having a massive effect on the series, in my opinion. And on top of that, Sergei Bobrovsky is kind of turned back into a pumpkin. People are saying Radko Gudis died tonight also. So Radko Gudis was playing hurt and oh. he got blown up on a hit and left the game. And I, it kind of goes back to that thing of if you're playing, if you're hurt, maybe you just don't play. Let an able-bodied player play, right? Um, but the officiating, I think, has really played a huge hand in, in mm-hmm. the outcome. But I also think tonight, you know, the score looks so bad for like the Panthers do this thing where maybe if, I mean, if they just Bobrovsky was not good. But that, that's so that's what I'm getting to is like the Panthers do this thing where if they feel like it's out of reach, they just start doing dumb crap. And they kind of just give up at a certain point. And I feel like tonight they almost got forced into that mode because Bobrovsky just gave them no chance. I mean, it was just short side goal after short side goal. And then in game one, totally different circumstance. Cause I don't, Bobrovsky, I don't think he wasn't bad or great or whatever, but they had a real chance to win late in the game. And they just take all those dumb penalties. Cause yeah. at that point you're only down two zero and you basically lose yourself the game. So it seems like the, Panthers are really obsessed with kind of being this like edgy team. And it's like, you got to get back. You got to get back to actually playing hockey quickly because this series, like it's getting away from you. Like, like now you have a must win game three. So as much as I kind of don't care about this series in terms of the teams, the way it's on the ice has just been like, it's like a car crash. I can't look away from. So, Yep. That's fair. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, there was one question that came in from lactic acid 69 said, wait, Jake and for Spurs. How are we feeling? I don't know how to feel. I mean, from what I've seen attacking football, high press football, I guess I'm excited. I, uh, like I'm skeptical because obviously a lower, not as good of a name as Nagelsman, not poach coming back. Like there's a whole lot of names that I w- would have liked more, but I mean, I guess I'll be hopeful. Oh, one thing I wanted to add is that being here in Quebec, you know, I've been seeing a lot of family and friends and stuff like that. And I've had multiple people ask me about Max Coltois on the Ducks. They're like, what's going on with him? Like, he wants out, right? Like, everyone thinks that there's this big, like, black cloud between the Ducks and Coltois. And I realize it's because the, the media here and, like, the media in Canada in general are always, like, they're the only ones talking about it. And so that's just what people are exposed to. And so every time I like start explaining it to them and after well, like they, they eventually get it, but Max Combs was just love and life playing roller hockey. Yeah. That, like I've straight up told people about the roller hockey thing and like their perspective on it just changes completely. But I don't think really... he wants to move at all. Also. I think he's happy. I Yeah, exactly. Like I don't, I the whole narrative that's been pushed, if he wants to be traded, I don't know who it's coming from. I think it could potentially just be coming from him. But now that Aikens is gone, like, who knows? So I, there, there was a quote about from Verbeek uh, that really felt like it was uh, geared towards Max Colmato about guys getting a fresh look, and they don't have excuses anymore either, which I thought was interesting. Um, but it really, that entire thing about guys are going to have a fresh look now. And, and granted, right. Colmato is an RFA; he needs to be signed still and but i think that he's someone that can really benefit from this yeah i like that's the thing i still believe contour can be a good player i mean he's i think 24 now yeah so like he might just this just might be who he is but the way that his development has gone i just it's been so bad i i still think that there's a player there so anyway it's just a funny little anecdote that people are asking left and right about max mm-hmm. also your cat is just looming in the background she's really funny i know i know she loves that box for some reason so she's probably gonna jump in there at some point she she's having a rough day right before we recorded a cat appeared in our backyard and i see her jump Ooh. on the ground and tail gets all floofed and starts making meowing noises i haven't heard from her ever oh. and yeah the cat eventually went away and she calmed down a little bit our cat is the same way. When she sees another cat outside, it's just like they just want to fight immediately. Yeah. Um, my All right. Parting note. Okay. Oh, do you have something else? No, I had nothing else. I was saying, let's get out of here. Yeah, it's twelve thirty for me. You're the one complaining. Um, 
my parting note is that everyone should visit Montreal because it's a very fun city. So many things to do. Um, also, if you're coming from the States, like the ad exchange rate is really working in your favor. Um, a nice discounted vacation. And there's just so many different food places to try. So everyone should come here. Okay. On that note, let's get out of here. If you want to help support our show, there's a few different ways that you can do that. The number one way is to check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash crash the pond. For $1 a month, you get access to our patrons only discord server where you can connect with other diehard ducks fans and get in all the jokes that we talk about here on the, on the pod, which I think you will enjoy. And if you enjoy our sense of humor here, but really this time of year with trades, with um, moves, with hirings, with contracts, with drafts, it's a great place to get instant reaction and to kind of almost rise above the, the Twitter fray. We've got Derek Lee in there, so you can get the behind the scenes action with him. It's a great place. It's for a dollar. You could you could really do so much worse with one dollar. For five dollars a month, you get access to two bonus podcasts from us a month. Um, so our last one was top ten players we start a franchise with. This month we'll do some more ducks related stuff. That's all at patreon.com slash crash the pond. Uh, if you want to support us in different ways, you can also check us out on Apple Podcasts. Uh, just search Crash the Pond, leave us a rating and a review. We'll read it on the show. That goes a really long way. Uh, you can also subscribe to us on Spotify. Leave us a five-star rating there. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, turn on your notifications so that you can see um, you can see when our videos go up. You can see the video format of the show. You can see Salem the Black Cat looming in the background, which is really funny. Um, <laughs> and then outside of that, check out the Sporting Tribune, sportingtribune.com. Uh, follow Derek Lee. Follow Jake at Reindeer Games 91 I'm at Felix underscore Sicard. And also a quick shout out. If you are curious about the draft and you want to up your knowledge, go check out the Elite Prospects Draft Guide. So good. Uh, really, really fantastic. I'm going to be reading that as I drift off to sleep tonight. Go check that out. We'll, we'll try to hopefully have some guys from over there on the pod for the draft. And on that note, thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you have a great rest of your week. And we'll talk to you soon. Have a good one. Bye.